the people are constantly scrutinizing the activities of the people in power. More than the government looking at the people, the people look at the government. This is reversed in a totalitarian regime. The people are scarcely ever allowed to watch the activities of the powers that be, whereas the powers that be are constantly scrutinizing the people on whom they wield power. So the idea of surveillance studies is that the state may endanger its own citizens. And the source of that danger is seen as emanating from external threat, internal threats, international threats, and it concerns the control of population and coercion is taken very, very seriously. So securitization theory was developed by Weaver, Dears, and Balzac. So these are major theorists who focused on the idea of securitization theories. And this involved the dialogical importance of the audience. And the securitization theory takes pains to explain the routines, the practices, the everyday practices of surveillance and the technologies which accompany them. And it is seen as a process beyond the normal realm of politics requiring exceptional measures. So the problem of securitization is deeply embedded within the idea of insecuritization. So you generate an atmosphere of insecuritization so that securitization is demanded. So that more and more, uh, uh, what do I say, eyes are gazing at you and more and more types of control and more and more types of collection of data is applied on the body of the individual. So insecuritization is always defined against specific political backdrops. So the changing scenario, the changing scenario will determine what is insecure and what is secure and what are the bodies that must be subject to careful surveillance and which are the bodies that have to exist, like Agamben said, in a permanent state of exception. So the insecuritization, which is defined against specific political backgrounds, will, will help you realize what are the uh, bodies of exception, bodies which are categorized as exceptional bodies and which are the bodies that are brought within the network. So this is molded, the idea of insecuritization is molded in the professional habitus of the activities that they undertake. So the habitus, I'm sure that this has already been explained, to the structuration of the field and the objective power positions that the agents have in it. And whether it is ascendant or descendant trajectories, their positionality in relation to the specific measures of threats and risks or vulnerabilities which are defined for you. So um, I don't think it is just technology uh, that has caused this great paradigm shift. There are many other reasons also. One is the rationalities of the government have changed. Their objectives have changed. The rise of managerialism, new risks or perceived dangers and political expediency and public opinion. These are the many factors that have resulted in an assemblage or modal, multiple modalities of surveillance. So, like I said, uh, there is this factor of uncertainty which troubles the human being a lot. I think Foucault called it the aleatory. And uh, the uncertain is what characterizes the times. Um, and was spoken about, I guess, in the beginning by Thomas Hobbes as one of the main attributes of the human condition alongside indeterminacy. So if you look at um, this idea of uncertainty, I think um, belief is also built upon this idea of uncertainty. You pray because you want to control the uncertain, because you're not sure what is going to happen. So there's predetermination, there is randomness, and uh, you have uh, this idea of the uncertain which emerges in between. So surveillance is not just a form of liberal governmental rationality that seeks maximum effectiveness by managing the market, managing the population, but it is also intended to capture the contingent, the fleeting features of that which is called the uncertain. And that is characteristic of our times. So classical modernity's aim, as represented by the discourse of enlightenment thought and science, was basically to remove the uncertain, to remove the unknowns. But the unknown can never be removed. The uncertain can never completely be modulated into the certain. It will always remain there. So if in Hope's times, it was generated by 
uh, human characteristics like perhaps selfishness or becoming greedy and all that. In the era of uh, late modernity, like uh, Zygmunt Bauman has told us, late modernity, the features are light, liquid, slippery, mobile. So these features in themselves contain the very firm idea of uncertainty. The pun is very intended. The firm idea of uncertainty is built into the uh, lived life experiences of the late modern period. So you have this desire and this idea of the uncertain creates in you a desire for bureaucratic or scientific identification. And this is because it surrounds the unknown others. And again, that has to do a lot with travel and communication. The uh, high speed of communication and the easiness of travel also has created this greater fear of the other. So the concern was that criminals or the vagabonds or people who had no place to call their own or did not want to be rooted to a particular place could become imposters, would pass undetected, threatening both social stability and the well-being of a people who supposedly belong in a place. So this is again connected to your idea of what a nation is and the idea of belonging to a particular space and the purity, I guess, of the people living in a particular space and they will be contaminated by the other. So this uncertainty gave rise to a further demand of surveillance. And Foucault uh, has a brilliant but very short insightful portion to question of the alien area that he considered as one of the natural processes that liberal governmentality had to deal with and regulate. So the aleatory event is one of the general features of the apparatus of security. And it is very contingent in nature because this can change. For example, uh, in a certain situation, it can be food shortage. It can be a drought. It can be a flood. It can be a COVID pandemic. So this uncertainty, this uncertainty has to be controlled. And it is with collection of data, collection of information, that one tries to control the factor of uncertainty. And as always has been said, in order to control the uncertain, more and more information has to be gathered. And to gather more information, surveillance has to become more careful, more focused, more pinpointed upon. So you have many factors that are contingent in nature, environmental, biological, even technological. So any incident, any event happening in any of these areas may impact the biopolitical management of the populations. So this is why the task allocated to security apparatus as to predict the possible risks that may occur with the ongoing changes in the environment or health or science. The concept of the aleatory, as Foucault said, appears then as the explanatory variable that justifies the focuses of the technology of the risk management that enable the prediction of these events even before they occur. So this is the great uh, desire to control the uncertain and to enable us to predict a disaster, predict a perceived risk before the risk occurs. So um, uh, you have uh, the study of crime, the study of diseases as becoming one of the essential uh, jobs of the state. And they were initially used in the realm of sec uh, the security to establish regularities. So the uncertain was the irregular and the certainty was regular. So uh, with the calculation of statistics and the idea of the probabilities brought in with mathematics, you were trying to regularize the irregular. And you, I, I hope you understand how power doesn't that at that point of time become coercive. Power rather becomes very, very seductive in nature, very luring. You want a powerful person to look at you because under his gaze you receive protection. Because he or the structure is protecting you from the unknown, the uncertain and the multiple types of risks that are involved there. So the biopoliticized surveillance taking the human body as a focal point of surveillance appears like a political technology of population management and a technique of reassuring populations in complex, uncertain context of times where security has become a huge priority. I think the best heterotopic space where the idea of surveillance, security and uncertainty blooms, one could say, is in the airport. You could see that. And um, people do not mind being frisked or looked at because if they are 
sort of feel that the other is a threat and therefore look at me more carefully. Um, and monitoring can be variable. The types of monitoring which is used can be variable. But there are certain, um, what do I say, common denominators that you can find. And one is the blurring of the boundaries, something that operates at different levels. For example, in the judicial criminal uh, detection system, the boundary between the police and the public is blurred as officials seek to position citizens as the eyes and ears of the authorities. Now, I live in a building and um, in the COVID, uh, you know, as the COVID pandemic increased in its dimensions, I found that the residents became more and more uh, police-like in their nature. Uh, but if you carried a bag, nobody would get in the lift with you because they felt that you're coming from far away. The security at the gate became more and more police-like in a scrutiny of you. Um, people could ask you any questions. The resident authorities and the president of, of this particular building gave a lot of power over us, over our movements, whether we had people coming in to visit us. So I hope you understand what I say when I talk about the blurring of the boundaries. And this is expected in routine day-to-day -day encounters with citizens reporting on suspicious, citizen, uh, suspicious circumstances and reporting on other citizens. It is also extended to other forms, particularly social media, where you, know, you are asked this question, do you find this post unacceptable? Is there nudity in this post? Then report the post. So you are being co-opted into this system of surveillance. So I will not pass any value judgments. I am not here to pass value judgments. That is up to each uh, research scholar, each person who wishes to prepare a paper to take up a stand and understand whether or where this trajectory is leading us. So a difficult political questions arise concerning the relationship with violence, danger and action and careful political decisions and judgments are required. So you have this debilitating metaphor of balance between two equal and necessary values that has to be in control. So security then becomes a joint venture. It is, a, it is timely information, it is surveillance plus the capacity for intelligence, it is preventive action as well. The assumption is that when you create this atmosphere of insecuritization, when this idea of insecuritization is very strong, the assumption is that citizens will happily give information in order that they enjoy a pleasure of being securitized. So securitized and for that surveyed to be protected by a group of professionals who are in charge of security. And who would not want to be protected in the face of violence? Who would not be seduced by promises of enhanced security, particularly when your body is at risk? So surveillance has become in the contemporary times. And when I talk about contemporary times, the focus is very clearly on technology, it has become simultaneously more visible and invisible. On the one hand, we go about our daily lives. It is hard to miss the proliferating cameras, demands for official documents, public dis uh, discussions about uh, the data valiance on the internet. At the same time, there is a curious invisibility surrounding these practices. So most of us very uh, blind, what do I say, very blithely go through these routines. We have sort of internalized these routines. Uh, thinking that well, this is part of the game. Uh, well, life is a game after all. And um, if this is just part of the game and you're supposed to play along. And that is when resistance becomes increasingly difficult. Uh, the actual operation of surveillance, the precise depth of its penetration, along with protocols of how one is singled out for suspicion or reward are opaque. Now, again, if you look at India, if you look at the errors that are being recorded, how uh, do you judge this? How do you understand at which point somebody becomes a criminal? How are you criminalized? So uh, why are you singled out for suspicion or why are you singled out for reward? Sometimes becomes opaque to all but a few select insiders. So contributing to this invisibility, like I said, are the hidden videos and audio recorders, embedded sensors, which silently gather and remotely transmit data. So I have friends who constantly record telephonic conversations. I don't know what they are expecting the other person to say, but this has become a trend. You record the conversations. You preserve the information. It becomes data for you. 
So uh, you are not part of the police, you are not part of the government, you are just an ordinary citizen, perhaps you are just a teacher like I am, but you are recording conversation for proof, for evidence, for documentation. So you are co-opting yourself into this particular system. So uh, democratization of surveillance means that even groups that were historically not uh, scrutinized, largely left unscrutinized, are now monitored by major institutions and sometimes by other citizens. So it is very difficult for anyone to remain away from the eyes of the uh, scrutinizer. So uh, this is what I was trying to get at in the beginning itself. The deadly, uh, this, uh, uh, this is what I intend to say, that the democratization of surveillance has translated into um, itself into approaching a leveling of social hierarchies on one level. What well, that is, initially, those who were left unscrutinized are also becoming the objects of scrutiny. But new asymmetries have emerged, and such that the surveillance of more powerful groups is often used to further their privileged access to resources. While in the marginalized groups, surveillance can reinforce and exacerbate already existing inequalities. So this is a very um, a dico paradoxical situation. If on one hand you find that more and more people, people who were not surveilled at one point of time, are being looked at, their information is being gathered, it has resulted in larger asymmetries within the framework of the caste hegemony, the gender hegemony, and any other sort of marginalization that was already there before the democratization of surveillance has taken place. So I hope that word will not confuse you. So the question that arises is, how can citizens respond to these developments, I, whether it is individual or whether it is collective? So this pride revolves around the debates about continued relevance of official privacy regimes or data protection provisions. There is a wide spectrum of opinion on this topic. And you have people who have some faith in the existing privacy structures versus those who are more suspicious and critical. So um, again, engaged citizens, citizenry, which is one of the main pillars of democracy, is very clearly demanded in these times of ongoing continuous surveillance. So, you, like I said earlier, you have to take into account the massive work done by anti-surveillance activists. But the problem that they face is the muted public response. And there is a combined, uh, com this is combined with a new willingness on their part to hand over information to assorted social media applications. And this has challenged many assumptions that scholars have about citizen engagement and the politics of surveillance. So I'll come to that a bit later on how we ourselves very happily divulge very personal information on social media. Um, so it was said that um, after the 9-11, post 9-11, because the 9-11 uh, for different places means different things, but because of the neo-colonial stance of America in the era of globalization, Anything which happens to America is supposed to have an impact on the world. And that is why we too belong to the discourse of the post 9-11, but we were quite far away from it. So uh, they were rather attacks were rather specific, but their surveillance repercussions have become very global. So, and it is from that point onwards that the most stimulating surveillance scholarship emerged. It did not um, focus on single events, but rather it put surveillance in a comparative and a critical framework so as to examine it um, with greater, what do I say, with greater focus. So uh, everybody sort of begins with the idea of surveillance with the panopticon. And I will not go into the panopticon because I'm sure everybody here knows what the panopticon is. And uh, we've moved into a post-panoptican society. So when we are talking about the movement into a post-panoptican society, we uh, have to understand that the basic ideology of the panoptican remains the same, but the modality of the panoptican has undergone a change. So within the panoptican, what happens was that uh, power was disguising itself by disappearing into the architecture. Like I said uh, in the beginning, you had no clue whether anybody was watching you or not, but the 
sensation that you were being watched was firmly built into your psyche. So power was disappearing into the architecture itself. So Bodhruva talks about the Panopticon from a point of view of you know, simulation, which he sort of specializes in. And he says that power disguises itself by disappearing into its architecture. And this assemblage fails. Panopticon, the Panopticon actually fails because it is limited to that architecture and to that model of enclosure. I hope you understand. Because within the Panopticon, that more, only if you are within that model, the architectural model, are you being looked at. But the Panopticon did not have this outside the architecture, is what Bodhruva was trying to say. So you have enclosure on one hand and confinement on the other. So the flow of bodies, information or contraband is enclosed, regulated. And enclosure does not require material constraint. The physical interior of the Panopticon uh, may be a gentler place of... Look, I will take the questions later. If you type the questions now, I will be thrown. Uh, I'm not such an expert as to handling both the talking as well as handling the questions. That would happen in a different scenario. Sorry. So the physical interior of the Panopticon may be a gentler enclosure than the actual dungeon or the prison, but confinement remains is technology. So the crisis of the Panopticon um, was multiple. One is that the walls have openings, they have access points and exits of various sources that was difficult to survey. And they're rigid and they create hidden zones where resistances can fester, can multiply, can increase and gain strength. And they concentrate populations and increase opportunities for intrigue. So people within the Panopticon can meet, uh, discuss and plan an intrigue. Finally, the problem with I bring in the market at this point of time, the production at this point of time, confinement cannot satisfy the expanding needs of capital for greater mobility of labor, speed of communication and risk management. So simulation does not confine the process to verify them. So confinement becomes redundant in the age of simulation. Uh, and the same idea inspires the most mundane situations from industrial processes to cloning, to control a process in advance by verifying its very first model. So you have, um, so Foucault himself actually recognized the transience of disciplinary society. And they succeeded, he said, the societies of sovereignty, the goals and functions which were quite different to rule on death rather than to administer life. But in turn, these disciplinary societies were uh, to be succeeded by the societies of control. So disciplinary societies and societies of control, um, it's a new monster in our future. So the disciplinary model of enclosure ultimately pro proved to be very inflexible, unable to adapt itself to demands of a changing economy for modulated controls over production. So you move slowly from politics into the idea of production because these two are very closely related. The modes of production decide the culture, the society and the structure of governmentality within a, a particular geographical area. So. Uh, now, Deleuze problematizes this by talking about interiors. Now, these are a couple of words which he uses, which are very, uh, quite brilliant in their idea of uh, framing the surveillance structures. He talks about interiors, which are fixed containers subject to panoptic control. But interiors cannot be sites of mode of production, because today the modes of production demands decentralization dispersal and mobile administration. So this is the problem, okay? And this requires a new model of enclosure. I hope I'm making sense. So Deleuze talked about the Panopticon as an interior, which is a fixed container. So within the fixed container, you put in the individual, what comes out is a citizen that you want. The product is a desired citizen that you wanted to create by pushing him or her into this fixed container of the Panopticon. But now with the modes of production demanding more and more uh, fluidity, the idea of enclosure has to reinvent itself. It has to be uh, made uh, freely available in, a, in multiple forms. So the technical logic, according to Deleuze, that, con that organizes this Controlled societies, as he calls it, is modulation. 
So you have on one hand the interiors which I spoke about and the other is modulation. So modulation doesn't work in the way the interior does. In scientific terms, modulation is a variable control over the characteristics of a wave. So as the wave changes, the um, means of controlling it also needs to adapt itself. So this is the it is all thriving on contingents. It is not believing in one fixed set model at all. So it is uh, not applied to specific individuals or rigid containers, rather to oscillations, to trends, to tendential movements that have defined statistical properties. So again, you have the spatial control and you have linear control as well. Because if you remember in the initial days of production, the linear control was that you go to school. If you are not at school, you're at work or you're at home. So there's complete control over your spatiality depending on the time framework in which you travel. But now in control technology, the control society, it becomes a factor. It becomes a trouble for production because it demands multiple temporal sequences simultaneously, often in non-linear ways. So I hope you have understood that um, what I was trying to say was that the type of enclosure that is demanded at present as uh, these um, modes of production have changed have demanded different types of enclosures and that has been likened to something called modulation which is capable of changing itself depending on the oscillation. So uh, the, you have the dematerialization of the panopticon and the growing abstraction of media of control in post panoptic societies as an information network rather than industrial production becomes the dominant model for organizing society. So you have what is called surveillance assemblages. So multiplicities. And Foucault also talked about the capillary nature of power. So within that domain of surveillance also we have these multiple assemblages which are rhizomatic in structure. So they are interconnected machines, some of which are concrete like the hardware in surveillance, the bioware. Others are abstract. You have codes, statistical formula, you have data. And this comes together in, to create an assemblage of surveillance. So, yeah, I think I am running short of part, uh, time. There's a, there are a couple of things which I want to clarify. And therefore, like Poster has said, from the world of the panopticon, we have moved into something called the super panopticon. And uh, it is an inflated form or a higher register of panoptic surveillance. You have Haggerty and Mann who have questioned whether the panoptic model remains suitable for the present time and they have envisaged an electronic panopticon which they have called the super panopticon. And the virtual world of data images where discipline is virtual. The super panopticon exists in a hyper reality that seemingly doesn't affect us. So, um, and these theorists have a problem with the idea of the prison metaphor. So they say that if society is becoming more prison-like, then why is modern life for the majority not more unpleasant? Here we have to bring in the idea of entertainment, where power reasserts itself through entertainment, through fun, the multiple modalities of power. And it is to arrive at this point that I am trying to use the models of the super panopticon and uh, the synoptican, which Matheson coined. It's a term coined by Thomas Matheson. And he sort of the portmanteau term, bringing synchronous and opticon, synoptican. That is the surveillance of the few by the many. So Matheson felt that Foucault failed to take into account the rise of the spectacle in mass mediated societies and where the few are watched by the many. And to make this clear, Matheson uses the word synoptican. So I think it is with the globalization and uh, the mass media where synoptican becomes very important. And you, the masses, us, we watch, purchase, consume, whether it is uh, the television serial, whether it is a movie, we are watching. So the locals are watching the globals, you could say. So these people, the major figures in the entertainment industry, are constantly being looked at by the locals. And uh, this, this is what I wanted to talk about as a synoptican. So the... Um, yeah, so the localness, now this is another point which is very clearly made by these uh, theorists like Poster regarding the synoptican. He says that, uh, again, you move from the synoptican into the omnioptican, which is 
uh, the model when the internet becomes a player and localness which is used to be limited to villages though this started with the synoptic okay uh, limited to villages uh, and districts started to address large scales with the rise of nationalism so this is how they tie up nationalism and globalization together because even though we feel that nationalism is a very uh, uh, what do i say it's an idea which confines itself to a specific territory and globalization is you know pan territory there are certain links which fair foster the idea of globalization within the nationalistic domain and uh, for this reason he says nationalism stands out as a significant step taken towards globalization in comparison to localization so with the mass media we sitting in kerala we are given information about italy about china and uh, you, i hope you remember that in the very first stages of the pandemic we were constantly watching we were constantly watching what was happening in italy not because many of us had even seen italy or whether italy had any relationship to us like like it was said in hamlet who is hecuba to him or he to hecuba that he chooses to weep for her uh, in much the same way the locals were getting involved in the global game so synoptican is a process by which it, uh, you sort of dispel the idea of the local into the nationalistic framework which takes you into the global framework so within the synoptic there emerges another player called the omni optical um because um in the panoptical like you said um the local elites were watching other locals in the synopticals the locals watch the globals and uh, with the omni optical everybody is watching everybody else but here digital identities are quite problematic if you uh, look at it what is the picture that you put up as your display picture you edit it you filter it you do all sorts of things with it and um, when you are on facebook the things that you like and all these things are carefully monitored by you yourself first so the digital identity is a very problematic identity because a lot of editing goes into it it is uh, what do i say it is how you want yourself to be seen or perhaps it is how you see yourself which may not have anything to do with how you look in real life for example the dp picture that i use in my whatsapp is uh, you know i i that's a picture in which i look least like myself but somehow that makes me feel very thrilled and that is what i put up on so it's a very carefully edited digital image of myself that i wish to put on screen so the omni optical which is the all seeing eye you have images transferred to computers to tablets to mobile phones by cameras which are located in places multiple places and by just clicking a button watchers can spectate anything they want so entertainment becomes the main ideology of ruling the world so what entertains you is providing data for someone and that data is being used to sort you categorize you and to exert control over you not just as a citizen of the a uh, particular government that which you uh, live in rather it also identify you as a consumer which is one of the most important identities or the crucial identities that has been pushed on to the individual the identity of a consumer so here that is why it is said that the people who find the real world difficult escape into the virtual world and lose themselves there at this point fun becomes the ideology so it began at a point when mass media started entering our conscious mind and it has sort of um, restructured our conscious mind completely with the advent of technology in the area of the internet so uh, facebook like bowman said you know facebook um, sort of dramatically illustrates focus premonition that people would come to take a more active role in their own surveillance and that is why bowman argues that we have built a confessional society where publicity is both a virtue and an obligation so drawing from consumer society bowman argues that social media users now this is uh, very interesting uh, social media users they are trying to commodify themselves all right they uh, they both the commodities they present and this, uh, they are the commodities themselves so it's like you are the commodity and you are the sales person so you make yourself as attractive as possible so that you will get 10000 likes 
and what are you projecting another commodity so your ideology becomes a commodity you yourself become a commodity and it just blurs the boundary between the actor and the acted upon the subject and the object the actant rather and um, you are always watched by somebody who is not visible to you but you are happy to give all this information uh, and google you know google becomes a huge massive uh, uh, you know web server uh, you know a technology way all the dots are joined together so your multiple activities the places to which you have traveled the photographs that you have taken these are data and all these multiple random dots are joined together and there are different portrayals of you yourself what your ideology is what your uh, thoughts are what your style sense is what your body is all these things become matter for information which is provided by you yourself and why do you do that because it is entertainment i hope you understand how politics becomes entertainment and entertainment becomes extremely and quite bewilderingly political so social media users treat themselves as a commodity so they are promoters of the commodity and the commodities that they promote so power is less about coercion and more about seduction i hope you get that because nobody is forcing you to use facebook nobody is forcing you to give up all that information it is because you want to so power becomes less coercion and more seductive which is perhaps more dangerous i would say and uh, now before i stop i think by 11:20 i will have to stop i would like to bring in another concept brought in by didier bigo where he talks about the panopticon so we move from the synoptical the omnioptical to the panoptical where certain people are banned from certain spaces uh, the criminalizing the crimigrant as they are called uh, the immigrant who is seen as a criminal the crimigrant uh, where your uh, what do i say retina scan will reveal your past activities your thumb impression will give them data and under the optical view you are banned you are banned from a particular space and um, you have mobile elites the kinetic mobility of the elites where they are free to flow from one space to another and then you have the refugees and then you have the migrants the what do i say the traveling work laborers the itinerant laborers that you see who are always like giorgio agamben said on the verge of the stage of exception because of this process called panoptical so this idea of vision this idea of the gaze which has sort of controlled the contemporary age uh, criminalizes a few uh, gives a lot of uh, what do i say lot of information and more power using that information to a select few so criminalizing of bodies and the idea of the pan of the gaze being used to ban certain people sort certain people as likely of being dangerous as likely because that is what i said earlier you are perceiving the uncertainty and before the risk takes place you control the risk by banning this particular body to enter a particular sphere so differential mobility it is nothing new like uh, david murakami wood i think people who are interested in the idea of surveillance or to read murakami wood not haruki murakami but david wood and stephen graham and they say that differential mobility is not a new phenomenon uh, it started from the way from people started to move from one place to another either you walked or you were carried either by animals or by humans and there have existed differences in mobilities which reinforce existing social structures so now we know that mobility of the new transnational upper class or the kinetic elite as they are called they benefit from the system of the panopticon which might become very very imperceptible so surveillance then becomes a very loaded term with sometimes sinister socially negative connotation but we are always on the quest for a neutral concept and that neutral concept we hope will finally succeed so uh, surveillance studies like i said initially is largely transdisciplinary because you have to look into ethical legal policy dimensions the idea of what terror is in different locales the idea of the milieu and the habitus all these factors are major game changers in the politics of surveillance so 
Yeah, like I already said, the idea of the immigrant. Now, and before I wind up, no, I, and I don't think I need to mention Sue's village because I guess it was already spoken about because uh, you talk about people from below looking at you and trying to control you. I think one perfect example for us teachers would be the feedback that we get. But uh, think, how honest can the student feedback be? Particularly if you ask the student to log on using a particular ID and record your feedback. Because data is always retrievable. How many students would very honestly tell you what you are to your, um, you know, computer person, digital identity? I don't know. It is not. Uh, I am not very sure about that process, especially in the, uh, you know, in a micro fascist space like the classroom. I always call the classroom an extremely micro fascist space. But this is a micro fascist space because the webinar, like I said, I won't take any questions now because it's difficult for me to do both at the same time. This would not have happened in a live audience because you would have just stood up and perhaps switched off my <laughs> mic. So, yeah, this is what I was talking about when I spoke about the modulation, the idea of modulation, tendential, as the uncertainty occurs, a new enclosure is formed. So, um, like I already said, surveillance has become rhizomatic. You have hierarchies of observation allows for scrutiny of the powerful by the locals or the ordinary individuals and vice versa. It is an ongoing process. And uh, yeah, before I wind up, I would, as the pandemic is raging, we will take a, just a very brief look at medical profiling. So you have uh, medical humanities, which are emerging as a very, very interesting idea of thought and research and debate. And you have a number of distinct medical perspectives that emerged during the 18th century. And the first phase, here, I think it was Akron Haidt who talked about library medicine. In library medicine, classical learning, the learning of the doctor was very important. This gave way to bedside medicine, when the problems of physical management of the illness and the classification of the patient's symptoms. And this was again replaced by the advent of hospital medicines with the advent of hospitals in Paris by the end of the 18th century. Now, hospital medicine, again, we go to Foucault, known as the clinic, or pathological medicine, or biomedicine has survived, and it has extended to so many years, centuries. So, there is a three-dimensional framework here, symptoms and illness. So, in this new arrangement, the symptom was a mark of illness as experienced by you or a patient, but to this, an indicator was added, an intimation, the intimation of the symptom. And from there, you move from hospital medicine, library medicine, and pathological medicine into surveillance medicine. So as uh, innovative spaces of illness potential are being looked at, and this is becoming so crucial in the present day scenario, where the monitoring gaze uh, goes, you know, the uncertainty, is there a cluster? Is the cluster going to increase? So the monitoring gaze is focused upon that space. And the three-dimensional body as a locus of illness is expanded. There's a fourth dimension added to it of the time-space community. Where you are will determine the nature of your illness. Where you are located will determine whether you are likely to survive or not. For example, if you have comorbidity, then perhaps your choices are, chances are less. If you are healthy, then the risk lessons but again the uncertainty principle very clearly exists and therefore these boundaries are very permeable lines that separate a precarious normality from a threat of illness so the entire health industry um, it's not about health that they talk about rather it is about ill health and illness so you have experiences inscribed the progressive realignment implied in the emphasis of symptoms in the 18th century, and signs in the 19th and 20th century, and risk factors in the late 20th century. Its calculability is given in the never-ending computation of multiple interrelated risks. It is subject and object, both the subject and the object, like I told, spoke about the social media, is the risky self. Are you risky? Uh, the two types of risks involved are, is your condition a risk to yourself or is it more of a risk to another person? Because if you are young and you are healthy, chances are that you may survive the illness, but you may transmit that you become a conduit to kill somebody who's older, who's not healthy. So these are dichotomies. So you have the problematization of normality. 
the redrawing of the relationship between the symptom, sign, and illness, and the localization of the illness outside the corporeal physicality of the body. For this, new medicine has important implications for the constitution of identity in the late 20th century. And, uh, well, there has been many studies regarding this, and medical anthropologists have also talked about how, you know, if you are certified ill and you say that you cannot get treatment in your own country, chances are that your visa will be accepted, will be given to you by a Western country far more easier than any other refugee. So you, the idea of the Benoptican sort of lessens when you divulge your medical information. And the uh, new idea of digital epidemiology. Its main goal is to detect health security threats worldwide in real time rooted in the mining of online data and including personal data from social media, even on behaviors of health behavior or health attitude. What is your attitude towards health? Um, this is the pandemic because, uh, you know, you, you have beauty pads and health pads and you're asked to wear this watch. Uh, Apple Watch and all those things to monitor how many steps have you walked, how many calories have you burnt. So you were surveilling yourself very, very carefully because you're, you were told that your body is a temple. So look at what you're eating and look at what. So your surveillance mechanism was there on your wrist. Um, surveillance mechanism is there in the app that you download, which tracks you, which tells you, uh, you know, what you are doing and whether you are at risk. So where does surveillance begin and where does it end? We live in a very complex age of being surveilled. And uh, how do we, you know, this is the problem with anti-surveillance activists. How do we differentiate between what surveillance is proper and what is not? This is where Agamben got into trouble in the beginning. When he spoke that, uh, about Italy's uh, dealing with the pandemic, he said that a lot of unnecessary furore is being created by the government and the press. Completely absurd that was. So this is where strong governments gain more strength in uncertain times, in aleatory times, like Foucault said. And we can just wait and watch and be extremely vigilant so that the state of exception doesn't continue. I think I'm uh, sort of exceeding my time. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, if you have listened, fine. Uh, if you have questions, cool. I can answer them now. Yeah, how does it go, Anand? Will somebody read the questions for me? Oh, we to unmute them. How does it work? Hello? How does it work, Anand? Ma'am, there are uh, there can be two ways either in the chat box or for directly. Up to you. You decide what is easier for you. No, they can come up with questions. They yes. they, they did it yesterday also. Yeah, fine. Questions? Hello, ma'am. Yeah. Um, as usual, it was, uh, it was fun to simply listen to you. And I'm sure there were, there were a lot of points to take home. I was just wondering, uh, doesn't the contingent nature of surveillance leading to inter- Hello, ma'am? Not audible? Yeah. Yeah, yes, you yeah. are. Contingent nature of surveillance? That leads to interchange of subject-object positions. Offer more ways of resistance. Like, for instance, the security guard, uh, he is generally considered to belong to, uh, considered to be belonging to the marginalized section. But he now exercises a certain amount of power. So I was wondering that in that direction. Yeah, hundred percent true. Yeah, but he is really a reporter, right? He reports to the uh, authorities. He becomes another eye. He becomes another point of surveillance. Yes, you're right. You're right. Perfectly right. And like I said, you have altering systems of hegemony. Right, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. In the past, yeah. In the in the past, in the context of surveillance. We could see a gap between the haves and the have nots. Only the powerless people were constantly under the gaze. But now, because of technology, everybody is kept under constant surveillance. For example, sitting in my bedroom using Google Maps, I can closely observe what is going on in the United States. 
so bro, so did technology did technological innovations in one way or the other bring about some kind of democratization as far as surveillance is concerned adanne kutti njan nartha parnu njan adiyam parnilla i had spoken about this i said that uh, i spoke about the locals watching the globals and the inversion the subject uh, object inversion and the subject object merging into one but then there are different uh, hierarchies which are being created there are different hierarchies and those who are marginalized continue to be mal just give you one example if three you have the advent of technology you have and i can only speak from the perspective of my gender right my examples would be definitely based on my experiences and my gender and um, when we talk about the video cameras all where all I mean, in every place the greatest problem happened when you know uh, cameras were placed inside changing rooms of uh, textile shops right and changing rooms of women but well, there are a lot of issues at stake here uh why does it become problematic when a camera is placed within a woman's changing room and not why is why doesn't the camera be placed in a men's changing room is one question so the this idea is that the woman's body is a repository of all shame and if she is photographed without clothes even without her permission she is slut shamed she has no right to live perhaps you understand so in that way racial profiling also happens look at george floyd what happened to him was a case of sorting based on racial profiling so where has the asymmetry gone away in one way yes i can look at you also i can gaze at salman khan six pack abs also uh, that gives me a sort of power gives me a sense of being in power because salman khan is stripping for me but that doesn't change the idea that the female body has to be covered up and the female body is the repository of shame and the female body if it is uncovered it belongs to a woman of loose moral values has that ever changed has racial profiling changed has caste this uh, profiling changed no it hasn't so that is why i said though it may seem like democratization of surveillance multiple asymmetries are still in place and the marginalized continue to be marginalized and if you look at cyber attacks women are most attacked the most attacked people and transgenders are another category of people which are who are cruelly attacked on social media i hope i have answered your question Hello, ma'am. Yeah, ma'am, can you hear me? Yes, you. Are you are very clear. Tell me. Ma'am, my name is Sanjida. My yeah, question. I think I know you. Yes, I know. <laughs> yes, you know me, ma'am. I was your student. Yeah, yeah. Ma'am, my question is: uh, We have uh, when we talk about the uh, the context of su- surveillance, we have a uh, religion, uh, fundamental religion or institutionalized religion, uh, who are constantly. Uh, make citizens under surveillance because in christianity we have the practice of confession uh how how can we contextualize this religious practices of surveillance is it a panopticon <laughs> uh, is it a panopticon or omnipticon or synopticon do you watch the person who is asking you to confess then it becomes synoptical as well <laughs> <laughs> yeah religion has reinvented itself isn't it you have services and uh, pujas happening online and that actually tells you that nothing really has changed it has found new modalities and you know confession yeah uh, we spoke of confession as the first step towards psychiatry and um, yeah, i think religion will reassert itself come what may look at the furor created about you know how dead bodies are disposed of It never changes religion i don't think will ever go away wither away the withering away of religion is i something personally i don't see it happening it will find itself uh, well so surveillance happens in religion doesn't it you have multiple people looking at you what you are wearing how you are talking whether you what is blasphemy what is not <laughs> so yeah i don't think there is much hope for optimism there okay ma'am thank you Hello. Yeah. Hello, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yes, you are audible. 
Yeah, uh, ma'am, uh, my name is Grace, and my question is, uh, you argued that we live in a uh, world of ubiquitous surveillance, where watching is the new normative thing, or being watched is also a new normative thing. I mean, it's okay that you are being watched continuously, you're being recorded continuously. So there is a loss of privacy in this. Uh, so how do you view the how how do you see this loss of privacy impacting the formation of self in a post panoptical world? I'm also asking this because uh, later on you also went on to say that uh, you know nobody is asking you to join Facebook or Instagram or anything for that. But there is also a force. The force comes from the fact that we need information. We don't need to miss out things. Uh, you know, earlier when face when it was Orkut, they said that you know everything is happening on Orkut. Now it's Facebook. Now it's WhatsApp, and then Instagram, where information is being disseminated, is being circulated, and one is always at the receiving end, and one doesn't want to miss out. So, how do you see the formation of the self in all this? I think I had spoken about digital identities, which are very carefully edited, and there is a perfect blurring of boundaries between the public and the private domain. And uh, as I said, Facebook becomes a public confession and booth. And uh, well, finally, it's up to you. You can get information uh, just by scrolling the news, all right? But somewhere, like I, uh, I think I mentioned that also, power is no longer about coercion. Power is about seduction. So this is the seduction part that you were talking about. You be, yes. uh, no, this is something you're missing out on. So come be yeah. part of it. And at some part of at, at point of time, you play along with it because that is all. Like I said, life becomes a game, a virtual game where you constantly play. And fun becomes the ideology of politics. So that I'm sure, hundred percent sure that if I am addressing students who are twenty or uh, twenty-two or below, you're perfect digital natives. You have digital identities, and I don't think. you can ever think of an, uh, an identity which is separate from your digital identity whereas for me in my late 40s i can easily envisage an identity which i had before the digital world struck me or impacted me i don't think that is possible anymore particularly you now look at this look at the situation now uh, mobile phones which were banned on the campus are being given to students so that they can participate in the process of teaching learning and evaluation isn't it So yes. yeah, so uh, technology is being used to tide over multiple difficulties. In a now like air level, one bus summer a month. Do you think students will sort of miss out classes? No. Automatically, the classes will be held online. So everybody will be within the network, and that is the policy of the government. So digital, uh, what do I say? Accessibility becomes one of the uh, per. what do i say primary rights of the citizen so how can you think of an identity away from the digital world yeah. when there is a perfect blurring of uh, these uh, what do i say boundaries between the virtual and the real and the actual i don't think it is possible anymore and let me tell you i do not have a pessimistic view about that that is change okay. and yeah. like mark said you know nothing remains unchanged but change itself yes thank you thank you ma'am Okay, ma'am. Uh, my name is Girish. Okay, can I ask you? Like, uh, hi. Girish, hi, 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 hi. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. Presentation is just a continuation of the question that the last yeah. participant asked about the same yeah. digital identity and the cyberspace. So, yeah. as you said, more than the power becomes a coercion than a seduction. Uh, you caught with the Bowman. So, uh, my uh, confusion, my uh, suggestion, I'm not a suggestion, question. Is it a, a kind of another postmodern logic of new capital formations i mean are we exactly. just uh, the illusion uh, illusions of essence of a new agency so is it an illusion uh, that means the subject object uh, inversion that we are uh, uh, averting or uh, giving another illusions of a new agency you put it in one girish that is what i was trying to say the idea of simulation where fun becomes political where you are be co opted into a system where you feel that you are in power at the same time you are being profiled as a consumer you are being profiled as a you know person who can be put in within the panopticon you can be a person who can be profiled 
as a crimigrant. All these things are there. That is why I said the idea of simulation, which probably gives you the idea of being in control, whereas the control is completely taken away from you. And you participate willingly. That is the, that is the crucial paradox here. Most of us participate willingly unless we are very, very vigilant about it. That's, a, that's, that's exactly what I was trying to say. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for your questions and feedback. And ma'am, thank you so much. It was such a wonderful experience listening to you. And for me personally, and my team, which is only for you, it is a and privilege to host you and your talk. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.